Welcome to this HCP Live Peers and Perspectives presentation titled, Who Stole Einstein's Brain? I'm Dr. Simon Murray from Princeton, New Jersey. I'm an internist, and I'm joined today by Dr. Frederick Lepore, a neurologist from Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Dr. Lepore is a prolific writer of scientific articles related in the fields of neurology and ophthalmology. He's one of only five neuro-ophthalmologists in the state, and he's had an avid interest in Albert Einstein for several years. He was one of the first physicians to co-collaborate with a, on an article to report on important information about the neurobiology of Einstein's brain, which is detailed in a, in a prior uh, peer-reviewed journal but is outlined in his current book, Finding Einstein's Brain. We're going to discuss this fascinating story of the quest to try to learn more about a physical basis of Einstein's genius by studying his brain. Welcome, Dr. Lepore, Fred. Fred. Thank you, Let's Simon. begin. You know, Albert Einstein is a cult hero and a local hero because we live in Princeton, and the first time I became interested in it really was I was in Elliot Krauss's laboratory, and I'd learned that his part of Albert Einstein's brain was there. And I went down to the lab and actually held a beaker in my hand containing some stuff with uh, gauze pads all around it. And it was Einstein's brain, and it really made me feel like, uh, wow, this is really special, you know? It's amazing. And so I started to ask around, and then your name came up. And so that's what interested me in this whole thing. So could you tell me what, how you developed an interest in this, uh, in Einstein's brain? Well, it's a little bit in fits and starts. I mean, I think you're alluding to that um, there's an incredible interest in Einstein, you know, f for throughout the 20th century. I'd say sort of a, a spike in the interest might have come in 1999. Um, on the brain front, there was an article published about the exceptional, brain, uh, the exceptional brain of Albert Einstein in The Lancet. Um, and Sandra Whittleson, who did the, did the paper, um, had access to photographs of Einstein's brain, and she analyzed them. She's a neuroanatomist in Canada, and the article got an incredible amount of play. It was uh, editorialized in the New York Times uh, as a, a wonderful study looking at Einstein's brain, and in particular, her hypothesis was that Einstein's parietal lobes, that part of his brain, the parietal lobes, were exceptional. And I'm really not doing a disservice to say, to sum up, that was the major thrust of that article, which got incredible attention. 1999, I'm reading that article, I'm a neurologist. And also in 99, to give you a sense of the widespread interest of, in Albert Einstein, was Time uh, nominated him as the man of the century. Um, he he knows out um, Gandhi and FDR. So I was, you know, I, I think I was more interest, interested in, in the neurobiological stuff that had come out of Canada. And um, I, pitched a, I pitched an idea to write an article, not, I'm not a neuroanatomist, but I pitched an article with the idea, why are we so interested in the brain of Einstein? And the Dana Foundation was nice enough to say, that's an intriguing idea, why don't you write an article? And I had to do some research. And that's probably where our paths paralleled a little bit in the sense that uh, I was able to, the, the two most important experiences to bring out this article was to see the two jars of what remains of the sections of Einstein's brain, which at that time, circa 2000, were in the old pathology laboratory at Medical Center Princeton under the aegis of the pathologist in chief who would be Elliot Krauss. And Krauss mentioned, well, you know, the guy who did the autopsy, Thomas S. Harvey, is still alive and he lives in New Jersey. And I had the opportunity for several hours, again, in 2000 to interview him. Wrote the article. Um, I said, we're, you know, we're very interested in Einstein. We're interested in the concept of genius. We're interested in his brain. I said, as a neurologist, I, I don't know if calling him a parietal lobe genius, which was the thesis in the original article, I don't know if that's the whole story. End of article. Forget it. Nothing more is going to happen. Um, because, again, I'm not doing research. And so that's when I talk about fits and starts. Things pretty much stopped in 2000. 
I moved on to other things. And then a, a wonderful paleoanthropologist. What a paleoanthropologist is people who study brain cases of hominid species, and they know a lot about brain anatomy and evolving man. So this paleoanthropologist, Dean Falk, contacts me out of the blue seven years later, 2007, and says, I read your article. I liked it. Do you have any access to photographs, any, any, any aspect of his brain, mostly photographs? And I said, well, no, I don't. Um, and the world took a couple of turns. And as it turned out, um, she asked me again. And I said, well, I know Dr. Harvey had passed away in 2007, but his very great friend who he lived with in, at the end of his life, um, uh, Ms. Cleora Wheatley, I called her up and I said, did Dr. Harvey have any archives regarding Einstein and his brain? She says, oh yeah, there's several cartons in the basement. Um, and you might figure, well, now one, one, the dominoes are all going to fall in place. You go look at the cartons and you're going to find these photographs, but it, nothing's that simple. Um, it turned out um, the family wanted them curated, and I, I put in, at, tried to act as a, as a good broker and try to put together a team at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, but, and I made some suggestions, uh, the, the Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian. But as it turned out, the museum that obtained those cartons is a museum that probably no one has heard of. It's very, very under the radar. It's called the National Museum of Health and Medicine. It's in Fort, Fort Detrick. New Jersey. It's run by the Department of Defense. They got these materials. The materials were photographs, photographs that no one knew had existed. I'll say dozens, but we subsequently found out there might have been hundreds of photographs that Harvey had taken prior to um, sectioning Einstein's brain at the time of his autopsy in April 18th, 1955. There were also probably 560 microscope slides of the brain had been sectioned into microscopic uh, slide sections. And so I was not able to get a hold of those. Those went to the National Museum of Health and Medicine, but the Harvey family was kind enough to say, well, you know, Dr. Lepore has tried to help us get this stuff. Um, please grant him access. So you figure, well, then the next week I must have seen the stuff. No, it, it took another two years to 2011, and that's, a backstory in the book, but so the next start was, do we get access to these photographs that no one knew had existed? And we finally do. And so I, we had eight hours in Silver Spring, Maryland, where, where Fort Detrick is. And I just took pictures. If you look in the book, there's pictures of the pictures that Harvey had taken in 1955. And the anatomist in this operation, and I'm going to really stress that the person, who, the smartest person in the room as far as the neuroanatomy of Albert Einstein is Dean Falk. And for three months, she had access to look at those photographs, relabel every groove, every bump, what we call gyri and sulci. And as the two or three months went by, she said, every lobe of Albert Einstein's brain is anatomically different from the human norm. Now, that's a pretty sweeping statement. And the thing that makes it a sweeping statement in the world of paleoanthropology is they have certain standardized atlases of normative human brain anatomy. And when compared to the atlases of Connolly and Ono, which are the only two we used and the only two I know of, um, it held up that, that every lobe of the brain had slightly different surface architecture. It got peer reviewed and it was eventually published in the journal, what else? The journal Brain. Um, uh, in, in, uh, it was dig digital form in 2012, but it, actually the hard copy came out in 2013. And that was sort of, so you could sort of see there was a period between 2000 writing that article and 2009 actually getting, uh, knowing that, that these materials existed and 2011 actually getting their hands on them so that we could come create some kind of data set that they could be analyzed. So it, it was not a smooth trajectory.